Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Welcome to Your Legislators. I'm Glenn Cerny and it's our 10th year and our, our first program this year that uh, we're recording up in the uh, Roundhouse and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Bill Souls from uh, District 37 and uh, welcome to Your Legislators. Thank you, Glenn. It's very nice being here. You're just, because it's quiet here with all of the din going on around us, it's, it's just kind of an oasis for you. Oh, it is. I mean, the whole capital is packed with people. There are kids here for different programs. There are things going on in the roundhouse or in the rotunda with programs. Committees are actively functioning. I mean, it, it's crazy right now. And, and, and it's part of the fun of being here is to see all that activity. It is. I mean, there's lots of energy. And I think when I get home at night, Morning seems so far away, but it seemed to have, the day went really, really quick. Uh, let's start out, uh, uh, District uh, 37. Can you kind of describe what, what your district encompasses? Because I think you're basically just north of uh, Senator Cervantes' uh, district, aren't you? Yes, District 37 is kind of the East Mesa of Las Cruces. I uh, very proudly call it the Oregon Mountain area of Las Cruces, where our newest national monument is. But it's mostly from the interstate to the east. So it's all the urban area of Las Cruces. You know, it, it, it's difficult. This is the 10th year I've been up at the Roundhouse for discussions like this. And, and, and the attitude's very different. There's kind of a pall as everyone's waiting for that next revenue prediction to come out right now. Is, is that a fair assessment? Yes. And every time we get one, it's worse than the last one. And so <laughs> in some ways we've the kind of the joke around the building this morning is everybody's still smiling and happy with each other because there's no money to fight over. And so when you'd have nothing to fight over, people keep liking each other. Well, and, and one of the, the silver linings, I guess, of it is uh, uh, Professor James Peach from NMSU. Uh, the other predictions are coming much closer to what he was thinking months ago now. Yes, and everything we hear internationally on the oil prices, oil is about 30% of the budget for New Mexico, and we all love that we can go fill our cars for you know, $1.60 a gallon or whatever current prices are. It's awful for our state budget, and so you know, we really are struggling with how to even meet the specific obligations without cutting anything, much less be able to put any new money in. And, and perhaps to clarify, what we're really talking about here is the issue with the severance taxes. And can you kind yes. of describe the severance taxes and how the oil impacts that? Yeah, and severance taxes, we have severed from the land the oil, and so the state gets royalties or monies off of all of those, which we use to fund education, to fund the general government. And when oil revenues are down, people don't pump as much, the state's not getting as much money. And so there's just no new money coming in because the state is so reliant on oil and gas revenues. And, and, and I know part of the theory was it's okay as gas prices start to deflate, that allows for more discretionary income and taxes from other areas start to increase. But we really haven't seen that at this point, have we? We haven't that much. And the things that I hear, and it's certainly not my area of expertise when I'm up here. We'll get to education. <laughs> we'll get to education. But the consumers actually are spending more because they've got more in their pocket from the gas, but also all of that GRT is oil well equipment, it's you know gas leases. I mean, there's a whole lot of the big corporate tax money that we're not getting because all the production is slowing down and shutting down. And so those are about balancing each other off that we're not seeing the, the increased GRT overall. And, 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 and the goal number one of this session is the budget. Yes. So it, it, it's obviously going to have very early play in, in how, how is that process starting to unfold? I only get reports about that. The budget starts over in the House and they certainly are looking and the budgets were built when there was on the order of 200 million new dollars. That's all evaporated. And so it probably changes on literally an hour by hour basis as they're trying to see what are realistic projections for the budget. And they're trying to project a full year and out as to how much money based on what is the price of oil and gas. Two weeks ago, we had uh, Senator John Arthur Smith, and he's infamous for saying, no, 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, he, he's somewhat the curmudgeon pessimist about the budget all the time, but it sure seems like that pessimism has uh, been protecting us lately from not getting in over our head worse than we already are. All right, so uh, we, we, we've known for some time that, that the severance uh, tax issue is gonna be somewhat uh, unpredictable. It's been very good now for how many decades, but we're, we're seeing that change. So it comes into different types of revenue. And one of them is, is to attract new business. And I promise we will get to education. I'm going to back door on <laughs> sure, that sure. one. Okay. But, but again, you've got LIDA, you've got a number of programs that are trying to stimulate the economy right now. What's the discussion on that front? Most of those. And again, there are people certainly, we're, we've got some closing funds. We're trying to bring businesses in. But just yesterday afternoon, I went to a program on Innovate Albuquerque, and it really is Innovate New Mexico, but trying to build our entrepreneurial uh, programs and focus in the state of New Mexico. And that really is building our own jobs rather than smokestack chasing of bringing other people in. And so I think, you know, as we move forward, we really need to build what's unique to New Mexico, what are our strengths in New Mexico, not trying to overly compete with other states for the same one and a race to the bottom as to who can give away the most to get some business in here. And so I very much support that and where we're using the brains and the talent and the things that are unique to New Mexico to build our, our base. Okay, here it comes now. One of the keys to developing <clears throat> business is workforce education. Yes. And, and, and I know that has gotten a special boost in attention from Governor Martinez. Certainly we all know that the long-term growth of the state is based on education, that we have to have a 20-year plan for improving education if we want to be long-term competitive as a state. And <clears throat> education is very much my field, and I very much want to work towards how do we build towards a world-class education and thus a world-class workforce. Too often, I think we look at education on a two-year or three or four-year political cycle instead of a long-term building from the very bottom. Are we starting to see some of that increase? I'm referring to like graduation rates and, and, and whatnot. I think there's been some positive news on that front, hasn't there? There's a little bit on graduation rates, but you know, again, that's been more on the short term of people who are just exiting our education program rather than setting them up, even preschool, getting them ready to learn and grow and develop. And that's a long-term process because we know schools at least 12 years and if we're looking at preschool at even prenatal and making sure that our students are going to be prepared to learn and develop their brains we've got to do that early on we can't just look at the end product and in in small incremental gains there we need to do it from the very bottom and, and you and I have been working together with, with the Engage New Mexico on yes. a lot of educational initiatives specifically in Doña Ana County but but it, it goes much further than that so well, what's the challenge here as you start to talk about funding for education of how you bridge what you're learning on the ground there and you spent how many years in education yourself versus what the funding is going to be used for how do you start to uh, can I use the word massage or, or, or direct well, and, and that's a huge challenge. I mean, certainly that's a big challenge. And I think it comes down to where are our priorities? Do we really believe that educating our children for the next generation workforce is important? Then we've got to make sure we're directing the resources to do that and not using the resources other places. And that means we have to make some tough decisions about things. Uh, you had mentioned the Engage and the uh, success partnership out of Doniana County. We actually are getting some real recognition around the state for the bipartisan and collaborative nature of all of that as the right way to start looking forward on a long term rather than a short term basis. But, but how do you stay focused? I mean, we've already talked about uh, workforce development, which is an, an older retraining kind of thing, which goes into your community colleges and your universities. We've talked about all sorts, and we haven't even started discussing pre-K education. How do you focus the attention that's needed on each one of those elements? Well, and in some ways, and I know I'm an idealist, but I think we have to be. We really have to look at the long-term education and as a unified program. And I feel over the last couple of years, we've been nibbling around the edges of education and we've tried to do what's easy and what's cheap. And 
And that's what all we're getting is some very small changes. We're not getting real change that's going to be long-term sustainable. And so we have to redirect that this really is the primary focus for the state of New Mexico, not just that education is for workforce development, but education is for the future of New Mexico. And, 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 and yet uh, I got up this morning, got a cup of coffee and picked up the newspaper and there's an article in there. We're back to discussing third grade promotion uh, again. Yes. Uh, what's the hurdle there? What, what's it? I, I know I'm being very simplistic, but it seems like it should be a pretty easy debate to have. Well, it, it's difficult that that's always on the table. And I worry that that's on the table because it's political. And there's a lot of messaging on how you put that, that it's social promotion is how the one side puts it. And people, when you go, oh, social promotion, we shouldn't do that. I'm trained in research and I wanna see evidence-based programs. And there's no evidence that holding back third graders improves their retention rate, improves their graduation rate. There's no evidence to that at all. And there actually is some evidence that it hinders their future. And we need to be doing evidence-based programs and we need to make sure that all students are supported all the way through and not fail third graders because they're not ready yet. And one of the things I often point out is first, men or men, boys, would be retained at higher rates because we know that males are slower at learning to read. I would have been retained under this law. I was not uh, ready for th to move on in my reading. I was a late bloomer for reading and I now have a PhD and I don't think we really want to be retaining people because they're on a schedule in their uh, development to be a little bit slower developing in the reading area. Uh, okay, uh, as, as a senator, and, and, and again, there's got to be a heavy dose of, of realism here. What, what are you hoping to see come out of the legislation and the budget th that's being presented to you right now from the governor's office at the end of this session? I think the key thing when there isn't any money is to make sure that education is not the one that gets cut and held back. Uh, that's a real concern is trying to at least make sure that we don't lose ground in education when there's no money. We're still trying to find a way that we can give a 1% salary increase to all educators at schools at all levels, including support staff. But that's a real challenge where we're going to find any of that money. And you know, we're looking at some potential things, but at the very least, make sure we don't cut education. There's some reoccurring things here that I'd like to, and, and some things we probably need to uh, update. Well, one that I don't think I've heard anything from my reading and following here is the increased cost of Medicaid on the, uh, on the state's budget. Uh, what, what's the situation with Medicaid? That's one of the areas we really don't have a lot of choice with it. And so the little bit of new monies over last year's budget, the two things that we really have to fund because we have no control over is we have to cover the state share of the Medicaid in the budget. That eats up, my, the last thing her, numbers I heard was on the order of $48 million. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the special education, and I'm trying to remember the, the name of it, the, um, the federal laws that we have to keep the special ed funding at the same level, we cannot cut special ed. Yeah. And so those two things have to be, and that one's about $30 million. And so, after that, there's nothing left. And those two, we really don't have any choice in our budget. And, and, and again, you're, you're talking about whittling away at, at, at what should be coming in and seeing it diminish. And then you've got, again, I mentioned uh, Senator Smith and his infrastructure is always a point of contention with him. And, and they're, they're just, it's really a tough session. It's a very tough session. And, and again, infrastructure, I drive up here to Santa Fe on a regular basis and there's some stretches of road that need to be redone and our gas tax isn't keeping up with it. Uh, there are areas down in southeast New Mexico that the roads are falling apart. And people don't always realize, but when the roads don't work well, commerce doesn't move, and it actually costs you on your car. Your car wears out quicker. And the estimates are for every person driving a car in New Mexico, it's about $500 a year because our roads are not high quality all the way around. And, and you're, you're and talking about an automobile, not a, an not automobile, not a rig, not a right. rig. Your automobile depreciates and the cost for repairing struts and tires and shocks and all kinds of things because of the rough roads, they estimate is about $500 per year. 
So we, we've kind of let ourselves into the other uh, conundrum being faced up here this session since we've talked about driving. Uh, how's that licensing <laughs> going right now? And, and, and it is yes. an, an odd sort of duck to be debating. It, it truly is. And <clears throat> excuse me, the we, I read the newspapers also. I mean, one of the bizarre things being up here is things happening right next door to me. I don't find out about until I read the paper the next day because I'm in my committee meetings. It's moving through the House, and that is a two-tier bill that would have a driving privilege card on the lower tier. Last session, the Senate passed what I think is a very responsible bill. It was bipartisan, passed 35 to 5 out of the Senate <clears throat> that put the top tier if you want a real ID license. I very much support that because every New Mexican to get a real ID license would have to take documentation down to the DMV, including a birth, an original birth certificate, other things in order to get a real ID license. And I think it's really unfortunate that the politics keeps talking about as if we just took licenses away from immigrants that suddenly everybody is real ID compliant. And that is far, far, far from the truth. You know, the truth really is that, you know, we need to, everyone who wants a real ID license has to get a new license through DMV and take all the documentation down there. The, the uh, clock's ticking. We're, we're finished with one full week. We're into the second <coughs> week, only two and a half left. Will there be resolution on the uh, ID, do you think? I absolutely believe there will. I think the Senate will again pass a very responsible bill that will make us real ID compliant without putting a scarlet letter or discriminating against immigrants or people who don't have, a, have or need a real ID license. You know, it, it isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the, the Senate has long had a reputation uh, of being cantankerous with the, with the governor. And that includes when it was a Democrat, a Democrat Senate government. and a Democrat uh, governor, so that's nothing new. But, but is there, well, how are the lines of communication with the House and the governor's office right now? Is there good dialogue? I really don't know. Uh, that's kind of not in my area. The leadership I know is talking regularly, both within the Senate leadership with both parties, and I know with at least representatives out of the governor's office, things that are happening in the House, you know, though that's kind of clear out of our uh, wheelhouse, so to speak. And so- For now. <laughs> for now, yes. And so we see when that comes back over. But, but I, we, and I, I've talked about this in, in past weeks on your legislators. Last year, there was a lot of finger pointing at the end of the session that things were done. And, and it was kind of passed off as being uh, somewhat of an issue with the Republicans now in control of the House, that there wasn't a cohesive kind of uh, step process. Is, is that starting to come together? Well, I've been here three years, and even when the House was under Democrat control, there's a lot of finger pointing between the Senate and the House leadership where they're pointing at each other and you know there was one day where our leadership shut down the senate because the house wasn't hearing our bills yet and so you know beside whoever's in charge there's always some um, contention between the house and the the senate and so it might have been a little bit worse last year once we get to the end and there's all kinds of the political game playing that goes on at the end you and I were, were kind of joking uh, prior to us uh, starting here about the difference between a short session and a long session. And, and this is a short session, and it is, it's a very different animal. You, you wouldn't think it would be that stark, but it, it's a very different kind of operation. Absolutely. And I tell people, I actually, I'm, I'm more afraid of short sessions than long sessions because you start running. There isn't any warming up. There isn't any stretching ahead of time. You start and it's just frenetic from the very beginning. And the long session, you kind of get e eased into it. It's almost if you're going out for a run, you kind of do some stretches, you do a little walking and you know, some jogging before you actually start the run. You start full bore in a 30 day session and everybody's on edge right from the start. There's so much going on and there's always that push to get the budget done. And so everybody's watching that while all the other bills are trying to get moved through as quick as possible. Uh, another area that the uh, governor has uh, kind of highlighted for discussion and consideration is uh, driving under the influence and, and, and crime rates. What's the status of, of what's developing there? I really haven't seen much as far as what's going on on the Senate side. Uh, there's lots of the messaging and things going out in the media as people are jockeying for support and for media attention. My understanding, and we've got some data that came out a week or so ago, is New Mexico actually is doing very well on crime areas 
if you take Albuquerque out, mm -hmm. that it's some of the lowest it's ever been in New Mexico if you take Albuquerque out. And so many of those bills are being uh, promoted by legislators out of the Albuquerque area. And there's an honest fear in Albuquerque. Crime is very high there. Mm -hmm. But statewide, it's not as big an issue. And down in Las Cruces, it's not that big an issue. But if you conglomerate the whole state, including Albuquerque, then we are, we've got serious problems in our state. So, so what would you see any <clears throat> type of, what, what type of legislation might come out uh, of the session here? I think there'll be a number of those bills are going to come over from the House. I haven't seen nearly as many being introduced on the Senate side. And so lots of those, when they come over, will then start dealing with those as they get out of the house. And there's real concern because many of those crime bills have money have to be attached to them. If we're putting more people in jail, we have to have more money for the jails. And as we've already talked about, there isn't any money for those. And so I know one of my questions regularly on those, where's the money? How are we gonna pay for that? You can't just push that off on the counties to pay for incarcerating people. We've got to have money attached to it, and we don't have that money coming in this year. I, again, about uh, two and a half weeks uh, left as you and I talk here. Uh, feeling for, will this be a highly successful session? Uh, I'm not even going to bring up that other word where you have to <laughs> might possibly come back. I'm not mentioning it, but, but are, are you comfortable with where we are a, a week and a half, two weeks into the session? I'm not comfortable. It would be a whole lot nicer if we were fighting over how to spend a whole lot of extra money that we have. We don't have any of that. And so I think the real responsibility for the legislature, both the House and the Senate, is to pass a responsible budget based on realistic numbers for the projections for 2017. Right now, my biggest concern is the projection numbers from different sides are very far off. One is much rosier than most economists and other people are indicating. And I don't think this is a time to pass a budget that is based on numbers that may not show up. We're much better off to be, have a pessimistic budget based on realistic numbers. If the money shows up, it's a whole lot more fun to decide how to spend the windfall that we get rather than halfway through call a special session to make additional cuts because we had a, a budget based on false numbers. Well, and, and, and you're getting what's referred to, I believe, as a consensus projection. Yes. How to explain how that uh, comes together and, and, and how that plays out. Yeah. When they talk about the consensus, there are, as I understand it, three groups that all look at what the oil and gas revenues, the GRT revenues, all of the kinds of the income, personal income tax revenues are going to be projecting forward and each of them come in with what they think those numbers will end up. And then based off of that, they, I don't know whether they take an average, whether they take a two out of three, but based off of those numbers is what they put the projection in. The Legislative Finance Committee, which is a bipartisan independent group, is much more pessimistic about the numbers than the Department of Finance, which is under the administrative, under the governor, which is much more rosy that all the economic things are going to turn around and things are going to be much better in the future. As is the other agency, and I don't really know exactly which one that is, but the LFC was outvoted by the other two as to what the consensus numbers. Most economists are looking more at what the LFC numbers were. Mm -hmm. So as we start to wrap things up here, what, 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 what are you, if, if, if you could grab one brass ring right now and, and say, let's get this done, this session, what, 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 what would your preference be? We need to pass the driver's license bill. We need to make sure that people who live in our state are able to drive safely and can manage getting their family to doctor's appointments, to schools and things of that sort. And it has to match with the real ID so that in two years when the federal government may start enforcing that for airplanes, that people can fly without a passport. We also need to make sure that people, when they need to get on our military bases and government ins installations can do so. And so passing a real ID that protects people's ability to drive, but also meets real ID compliant with the national, with the federal government, that's gotta be our number one thing. And obviously passing a responsible budget and a responsible budget. And I'm a big proponent of increasing money for education, but I'm also a realist and want to be responsible. And that means 
No well, and, and it's odd as you talk about the uh, real ID and the, the economy. I mean, uh, just that uh, making it more difficult for people in the military bases to get in and out. And, and when you get up to Los Alamos, I mean, that starts to have another negative impact there. Certainly, certainly. And, and we've got to get that done. We've got to get it off the table as a political issue, which it's been instead of an issue that we're trying to solve. And I think, again, last time the Senate, I think, passed a very responsible bill that meets both requirements. I would hope you know, that we do the same thing. The House is going to pass one, which probably is going to be different, and it may end up in a conference committee to work it out. But I think all sides believe that that's got to get done this session. I, I can hear in the background they're calling for uh, yes. meetings and everything, so it's time to get back to uh, work. You're, you're, you're around the first turn and uh, through the backstretch right now. Uh, uh, Senator Solz, thank you so much for taking time to, to chat with us on your legislators Glenn, today. it's always a pleasure. I mean, I, I love talking with you, and obviously I love talking about politics. My job up here, education, is always something that I can, can talk about because it's, it's where my passions are. And, and we appreciate you taking the opportunity to uh, invite us into your home to uh, talk about what's happening in Santa Fe. Reminder, you can keep up to date on what's happening in the session uh, each and every morning on Morning Edition on KRWG. And remember, because of donations from viewers like you, this program's able to air now for 10 years. I'm Glenn Cerny. Thank you for watching Your Legislators.